Alright guys, how's it going? I'm still in Scotland and I'm finally over all my PC problems. And at the end of my last video here on CES, I talked about how my next video was a big and important video. But sadly that hasn't quite materialised the way I expected. It happens sometimes, every so often a source or two just won't come through for me. Or maybe the video takes a direction that I wasn't really happy about and I have to go back to the drawing board. This is effectively what's happened now twice with this video, but I will get it out at some point. But it has meant that it's been over a week since my last one. So for today, I'm throwing out another tech talk and there's been one or two important bits of information that maybe you missed and it's probably worth a short video. So we'll start off with NVIDIA and their CEO Jensen Huang speaking at CES on the future of autonomous vehicles. At what point did you realize you were not making cool video games, you were changing the world? Now, we, we started in video games because, because we, we, uh, we realized this, this, um, uh, this combination that I was talking about. Uh, but as quickly as we could, as, as soon as we started discovering the scale that, that it provided, uh, we moved into workstations, we moved into high-performance computing, we moved into servers, we moved, moved into, moved into uh, uh, supercomputers, into the cloud, and um, self-driving cars, and you name it. And so, so it's, it's, really, it's really 3D graphics and video games is the, if you will, the, the engine of innovation in our company, the engine of R&D scale. We're the only company in the world that I know of today, that can build a supercomputer processor, uh, invest four or five billion dollars to do it, and without one single purchase order from a customer, ramp it into a billion dollar business. And the reason for that is because we know there are 200 million GeForce customers who are dying to get their hands on the next generation processor. Nobody else can do that. And that gives us incredible incredible scale, incredible latitude. So that was a very upfront and candid response. Gamers are driving NVIDIA's R&D efforts into cars and AI. This won't be a surprise to most of you, but on some forums you will still see people claiming that NVIDIA's lead over Radeon has come down to massive R&D spending. The fact of the matter is, all that R&D is going into cars, AI, high performance computing, and I'm sure we'd all love to believe that all the billions of dollars that NVIDIA makes today would go back into gaming, but now you've got it straight from the horse's mouth. NVIDIA makes a fortune in gamers, they spend it on cars. Sadly though, this is by far and away not the worst issue that gamers are facing today. So a quick jump over to Newegg to look at some graphics card prices. GTX 1060 6GB, $530. What's this one? That one looks pretty cheap, but it's only the 3GB version. And here's a 6GB version at 360 but it's out of stock. A 6GB ASUS for only $840. And scrolling down, you can see the same story. Basically speaking, 500 bucks is now the entry-level price for a 6 gigabyte GTX 1060. But that's fine, we're just going to switch over to AMD and buy an RX 580 instead for the bargain price of $810. Well, here's a good one, $761, I think I'll buy two of them. Now, you can pick up the 4 gigabyte versions pretty cheap at only $480. And what we're looking at here is just gaming apocalypse. I don't even want to call these cards mid-range because I do not believe they are mid-range. These are entry level as far as I'm concerned, but they are now selling at higher than enthusiast prices. And the reason is, of course, mining. There's been a lot said about Bitcoin recently and the massive crash that it had, but do note that it is still massively up on this point last year. And according to DigiTimes, TSMC has received an urgent order from Bitmain for 100,000 12 nanometer HPC chips at the beginning of 2018. Now these are Bitcoin miners, 100,000 of these, which is an awful lot and TSMC are making a lot of money on this. And while I'd love to tell you that it is a bubble and it's going to burst, you can only be proven wrong on that so many times before you just accept that this is the new normal. And with a bunch of new industries popping up around Ethereum, the price of that continues to rise and rise as well. So it's like I said in that last crypto video I did, it just looks like it's going to do the same as Bitcoin. The number of people who are emailing me to tell me about their mining rigs, it's just absolutely staggering. It seems like the entire world is jumping in on this. But of course, it really is just mostly us tech guys that are doing it, at least in terms of the mining. And there is still room for plenty more graphics cards to be sold. With GPU prices being this high and the memory guys acting like a cartel, I honestly can't remember a worse time for building a new PC. 
With a bit of luck though, things will hopefully have settled down by April and the release of AMD's Ryzen 2000 series. And I was made aware of this video taken by upcoming YouTuber Solid State Tech at CES with AMD's James Pryor. It was a very good interview and you should check it out. I'll leave a link in the description. The most revealing part of the interview was this. So I've noticed, especially in the naming scheme, these new APUs are the 2000 series. Yes. You guys have... Um, come out and said very openly that you believe that this is the second generation Ryzen mm -hmm. CPU um, with all the improvements you've made. Are those the same improvements that we're going to see in the new 2000 series desktop CPUs in April? Or is that even potentially a third generation, so to speak? No, they're all desktop 2000 series. The, the, the improvements to the boost algorithm, the improvements in the silicon level for the memory latency and cache latency, and the improvements to the efficiency where we're uh, using lower voltages for uh, the same frequency, all of that is common between those two products. So that's why they're the 2000 series. If you look at how they perform and how they deliver that performance, they're, they're very similar in that respect. So that's why they're lined up to being the 2000 series together. Mm -hmm. So that's all rather straightforward. The upcoming Ryzen 2000 series that we're all looking forward to is basically identical to the recently announced APUs available in February. That is of course your Ryzen 5 2400G and the other one was the 2200G I think. Now what's interesting and slightly disappointing I have to say about this is that these Ryzen APUs are of course the same silicon as Ryzen Mobile. Those little 1525 watt APUs for those thin and light ultrabooks. These 2400Gs, 2200Gs is the exact same silicon as in those ultrabooks. The main difference is they've got higher clock speeds and a higher TDP. But if we say that Ryzen Mobile launched, what, a couple of months ago? And with the next generation Ryzen desktop series launching in April, that's a gap of six months without additional technologies. So we know it's going to have the better precision boost, allowing for higher frequencies at lower voltages, that kind of thing. And of course we do know that the next series desktop CPUs do have low more latencies which should help improve performance. I was just kind of hoping for a little bit more. Six months is a long time, but there is of course a point where you have to cut it off and say, we need to go forward with this. But an earlier suspicion I had in a previous video, where I believed that the second generation was finished, basically just waiting on Global Foundry's 12 nanometers maturing would appear to be the case. So if we're not looking for massive increase in IPC, we're basically left with the clock speeds. It is of course the new 12 nanometer process, and we have seen AMD claim greater than 12% uplift. To most people that would mean a 4 GHz CPU would be 4.4 GHz. But you might err on the safe side and say 4.3 instead. And yesterday, over at Hardware Lux, they discovered a Ryzen 5 2600 on the SciSoft benchmark. And we can clearly see the 2600 naming there. Now it is an engineering sample, probably coming out of ASUS. Over at Video Cards, I've made a little chart of it all, and we can see the comparison here of the Ryzen 5 1600X, the new Ryzen 5 2600, and the Ryzen 5 1600. And the 2600 basically slots in right in between these two CPUs, with a 3.4 GHz base clock and a 3.8 GHz turbo clock, which is in fact only around 6% uplift in frequency over the Ryzen 5 1600. Whether or not this will rise over time, we simply don't know. But if you remember back to the initial Ryzen launch, around about this time in January, AMD was still increasing clock speeds all the time. And what started off as a 3 GHz 1800X, as we know, ended up at 3.6 GHz. And with this being an engineering sample, there is a chance that the final clock speeds will be higher than 3.4 and 3.8. Right now, we simply can't tell. And a user over at Reddit compared the result of the Ryzen 5 1600 to this new 2600 CPU. And looking at the performance versus speed score, that is the speed efficiency say what should be IPC, we can see that the new CPU has a 9% lead over the current 1600. So that looks like a 9% increase in IPC. The problem here though is, as you just learned during the James Pryor interview, we know that the new Ryzen has precision boost too. So even though both CPUs are showing 3.4 here, we're not entirely sure that that is the case. And to err on the side of caution, the assumption should be that the 2600 is running at a slightly higher clock speed, maybe as much as that 200 megahertz. So instead of 9%, we're probably looking at around more like 4% in terms of IPC gain. I'm just going to go ahead and say 5%. Again, I am disappointed with this because I was really expecting more. But the fact is, it's six months forward from the time Ryzen Mobile was launched and we're basically dealing with the same core, just on a slightly different process. Regarding the process, I think the most important thing here is the top end. We all know that Ryzen is great in multi-core already. It is plenty fast there. The really important thing here 
is getting the top end to at least 4.5 gigahertz. And whether or not the 12 nanometer process will allow for that, we simply don't know. Again, this is an engineering sample, but it lines up so nicely for me here that it looks more like this is by design. We could imagine seeing the Ryzen 5 2600X in there with a 3.8 gigahertz base clock and a 4.2 gigahertz turbo clock. It's not exactly earth shattering stuff. The big thing then would be just how much more can the CPU get from XFR? I was asked a couple of weeks ago what I thought would be a good result for the next generation Ryzen. And my response to that was 10% faster overall is mediocre and 20% would be great. And based on this information, I would have to say we're looking at a mediocre increase in performance. And that would be my expectation today, certainly in multi-threading, but XFR and gaming could be wild cards. If the latency has improved enough, we should expect to see some good results in gaming. Another point of interest here is that AMD needs to have this Ryzen 5 2600 compete on at least equal terms with the i5-8400. We should expect to see this 2600 slot right in there as competition against that part. In a way, during the original Ryzen launch, AMD really got lucky because Intel really did have nothing there to compete against the 1600s. Now that they do have competition there, AMD are not going to get away with a mediocre increase in performance at the same price. I do not believe their superior multi-threaded performance will be enough if they are still falling short in gaming. Right, so just finishing this one off, getting back to the whole mining graphics card situation, these absolutely crazy $600 plus prices on the RX 580. And now we see even the NVIDIA cards are running around the $500 plus dollar mark. And I honestly just cannot see an end to it because you look at NVIDIA now, they continue to make more and more money every single quarter and they are still selling an absolute ton of graphics cards to gamers. But now because of the shortage of cards like the RX 580, the miners who would much rather have the AMD cards basically have to go for the NVIDIA card instead because they are still profitable. And think about what that means from the perspective of NVIDIA. Let's say they were ready to launch Ampere or whatever the next architecture will end up being called. They're not going to launch a bunch of new graphics cards in this environment. Why would they? They are making an absolute killing on low to mid level cards. In fact, they're making an absolute killing over the entire range. What is the incentive for NVIDIA to release anything new? There isn't any. And I've talked before about how we got into this situation because AMD cannot afford to risk manufacturing more cards. If AMD could risk manufacturing more 580s, then these NVIDIA cards would still be priced around the $300 mark because the miners would rather have the 580s. It's the lack of 580s causing this. And the kicker here for NVIDIA is they can risk manufacturing more cards. And that is almost certainly what they are doing. They will be throwing out as many of these as they possibly can, knowing that even if Ethereum collapses tomorrow, they will still shift these cards to gamers at a more than reasonable price anyway. So let's just say Nvidia does that. They go ahead and they manufacture millions more of these cards, and then all of a sudden Ethereum collapses or something else happens where the miners don't want them. If Nvidia found themselves sitting on millions of cards, they would not even consider launching Ampere until those cards were sold. They don't have to. AMD clearly has nothing to compete with in the gaming market. 12 nanometer Polaris, even a 12 nanometer Vega, that's not going to scare Nvidia. They are a mile ahead. Their worst case scenario would be selling a card like the GTX 1070 and GTX 1080 at true mid-range prices. That's about as much as we should expect from Polaris and Vega on 12 nanometers, if either happens. So the incentive for Nvidia to give you more is basically nothing. And let's be honest, miners paying 500 plus for cards? Why would they even care? And the exact same thing can be said for AMD. Because these two companies are making an absolute killing on crypto, and it is likely to continue. But right, that's me done with this one. I know stuff like this is not really what you watch the channel for, but just bear with me while I'm here in Scotland. It's a somewhat less than perfect environment, and I'm just doing what I can until basically I get back to Sweden in maybe four weeks time. So keep that in mind, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out all the links, my Amazon shop and all that kind of stuff, and hopefully back to a more normal video at some point next week. We'll catch you later guys.